good this morning to look out and to see many visitors. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us. We hope that if you are visiting, that you'll want to come back and be with us again real soon. It's also good this morning to see Sister Dottie Pettis back with us after being out for several weeks and being sick. And also, Brother Peebles would like for me to thank each one that has brought boots and underclothes and locks and various other items for the Room in the Inn program. Uh, this past week, several pairs of work shoes were passed out, and uh, we are grateful for your participation, and thank you so very much. Ladies, if you are planning on going on the retreat in a few weeks, the ladies' retreat, which will be dealing with the Reach Up campaign, if you would please indicate on the back of your attendance card today that you're planning on going, it would be very appreciative. There are some others that would like to go from other congregations. And first of all, we want all from Woodson to go, and then if there's any extra room, then to invite some others. So if you would indicate that this morning on the back of your attendance card, it would be very much appreciated. Will you bow with us as we talk to our Heavenly Father? Dear Lord and Father of all mankind, we're thankful for this glorious opportunity today to sing, to pray, to meet around the table, to study. Father, for these avenues of worship and for what they mean to us. And then, Father, to give back of our means so that we can see the gospel as it's carried into various parts of the world. And to receive reports back that people have been baptized. Father, this is an encouragement to us. And we know that heaven rejoices when people are brought to thee. When people commit their lives in total dedication. Thank you for thy word. For the power of thy word. That it has the power to move mold and to motivate each one of us. And Father, we pray that you would be with us today in our study. We may say those things, do those things, that will be most encouraging to each one of us. And Father, we continue to pray for our sins. And Father, today we continue our prayer for Luke Edwards, for Sister Beulah Tubbleville, Sister Sally Barnes. We'd ask our richest blessings to be with each one of these and bless them. Father, as only you know of their needs, their cares at this time. And for those that have been sick and been in the hospital and are better and back with us, thank you, gracious God, for hearing our prayers and for answering our prayers. That's a very favorable way. Continue to love us, continue to encourage us, and continue to bless us as we travel here upon your footsteps. Continue, Father, to encourage us in those things that are right, to feed us in what is wrong. We'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, Faye and I had the opportunity of going to the Bible lands. Early one morning, we got up and boarded a, bu a bus. And we left from the city of Jerusalem and traveled all morning down to the Dead Sea. When we arrived at the Dead Sea, we went to Masada. We got on a cable car that carried us up to the top of Masada. And our guide told us that Masada was the summer home of King Herod. And our guide also showed us from the top of the mountain, down below, where that the Romans, when they came to invade, where that they had camped. Our guide showed us a back 
a hill that had been made by hands around where that the Romans marched up to the top to find that many were already dead with the intent to kill those that were living. And almost every person that goes to Jerusalem to the Bible lands, do you want to or not, it is a part of the tour. And they carry you to the Dead Sea and you board that cable car to the top of Masada. To them it is a very special place. And the day of graduation for every soldier, whether it be male or female in Jerusalem, before they receive their graduation, they are carried to the top of Masada. Every military person on the day of completing their training is carried to the top of Masada. And the sergeant steps out in front and clicks his heels and tells the group, one day we stood at ease and the Romans came to invade. We thought that we were safe at this retreat, only to find that we were not. Today you make a commitment to protect Jerusalem and you will die if need be for this country. Then together they will reply back yes. We will commit ourselves to the protection of our land. They make a great commitment and they stand by that commitment. The last few weeks I watched, as many of you did, a lot of the Olympics at night on television various times. And sometimes the announcer would announce to tell how many hours that there's people depending on the sports that they were participating in. How many hours of training have gone into preparing that individual, making that individual ready to go to the Winter Olympics and to compete? All of that is commitment. Committing their bodies committing their talents, committing themselves to what they want to do. It kind of reminds me of the story that we read about in 1 Samuel. It's in the first three chapters. Now, Penana had two wives. One's name was Penana. One was Hannah. Penana could have children. And Hannah could not. And when they went to the temple, Hannah cried and wept and prayed to God that she might be able to have a son and made a commitment. God, if you will give me a male child, I will give him back to thee all the days of his life. That request, prayer was answered. And she received the child. And at the right time, when the child was grown enough to be on its own, she carried him to Eli and committed that child to the service of God the duration of his life. One night while he was asleep, Samuel heard his name called, and he answered, Here am I. 
when he went to Eli. And Eli said, I did not call thee. And it happened a second time, it happened a third time. And after the third time, Eli said, it must be God. Back, and if you hear the voice again, then to say, speak, thy servant here. And the voice came a fourth time. And Samuel answered in the third chapter and said, Thy servant here, speak for thy servant here. I believe that Samuel was saying more than, Lord, I'm just ready to listen. I believe that he was saying more than, Lord, I want to know what you have to say. I believe that he was saying more than, Lord, you've already disturbed me at least three times tonight. I have been unable to sleep. Whatever you have to say, please say it to me so I can go back to sleep. I do not believe for one minute that those were the thoughts that Samuel had. When he said, speak for thy servant here. I believe that Samuel, though, was really saying, Lord, whatever you would want me to do, I'm ready to hear and I'm ready to obey you. I'm ready to commit my life as my mother, as my father wanted me to. This is the type of commitment that we need today in the Lord's church. This is the type of commitment that can turn a city around. With this type of commitment, one single congregation in this city could turn this city around. A city that every year has increased in the number of murders and rapes and burglaries. A city that has increased every year in the last several years with crime. If the Woodson Chapel Church, if we were as committed as the athletes were in the Winter Olympics, if we were co as committed as Hannah was in giving her son and Samuel was when he cried out to the Lord, if we would only be as committed as those Jews that are carried to the top of Masada and said, look and remember what happened at one time, how that the Romans came in and invaded us and how that they stripped and left and stole the gold and the silver. Remember back and now be committed that this will never happen again. If as a congregation, if as a church of God-fearing, God-believing people, if just Woodson Chapel was committed, I believe that we could turn this city around. Are we committed to Christ? Are we as committed as those in the Olympics? As the Jews that march to the top of Mount Sada every year. Those who graduate from high school and those who graduate from the service. Are we as committed as Samuel and his mother? Jesus can make a difference. Jesus can make a difference in the city of Nashville. And for Jesus to make a difference in the city of Nashville, we must make a difference in the city of Nashville. People must look at us again as a church that believes in the Bible and reads the Bible and studies the Bible and knows what the Bible says. And until our city recognizes and sees us as that person, then we will never make a difference. And it simply means that we are not committed to what we believe in. We sung the song just a moment ago. Working for Christ. Are we ready really to commit? Our lesson today is on commitment. We can only commit if we want to. We can only turn the world around for Christ if we want to. I find it true today in Nashville. I find it true throughout the world as far as the Lord's church is concerned. 
And it reminds me of the story that I heard recently about the ship. And the story was simply this, a while out on the deck, there are many festivities and excitement. And while there is glorious music going on on the deck, underneath the water line, there's a leak. And the ship is slowly sinking. But those on top of the deck know nothing about it. And they are at ease. Kind of reminds us of the story of the Titanic. While those that were on top for a period of time were at ease not realizing and knowing the problem underneath. And then finally the time came for people to leave in the lifeboat. And many went down with the ship. I need not tell you that there are a lot of great things and wonderful things about the Lord's church. But I need not tell you either that there are also some serious problems with us. For some of us have lost the desire to win lost souls. For some of us no longer see the need to evangelize the world. For some of us are satisfied in our own world, merely taking care of ourselves, while a world round about us is lost and slowly sinking below the water level. There are a lot of things that we can do. Some of those things are to go back to the commitment that we made. The commitment that I made when I stepped into the water and when I was baptized and when I stepped up out of that water. And when the Bible tells me that I became a new person, new goals, new desires, I made a commitment. Have I changed my commitment? Have you changed your commitment? Has the commitment that Christ expected us to make, has it changed? The commitment from God has not changed. It is the same commitment that was by Jesus Christ when he ascended into heaven, when he told those 11 to go into the world to teach and to preach that the world might be saved. When I stepped up out of the water, I accepted that commitment to continue to do likewise. For now, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. For now, I am one of his servants. And now the responsibility is on my shoulders. Are you here to tell me today that as a Christian that the responsibility is not on your shoulders? Are you here today to tell me that you do not have the same commitment no, I know you well enough. And my commitment is your commitment, and your commitment is the commitment that Jesus made to those 11. And we must be about our Father's business. Woodson Chapel is perhaps leading the congregations in this city as far as volunteers for the room in the end program. Woodson Chapel is way, way above average for attendance in Bible study, for Sunday night attendance, and for Wednesday night. I know because I receive a lot of people's bulletins. And I know a congregation that has between seven and 800 on Sunday morning and will have 300 on Sunday night. Where is the commitment? And with 250 plus that have volunteered for the room in the inn, let's have 400 plus 
to volunteer to reach the lost. You say, wonder why do you say 449 or 500? I realize that they, there are some babies here that cannot. Cannot knock doors. Cannot go out after the lost. So I'm excluding them. But the challenge is for the rest of us. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to the book of Luke. Jesus is speaking in Luke the 13th chapter. And I want you to notice in verse 6, 7, 8, the parable that Jesus uses. He spake unto them this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and found none. Cut it down, why cometh it this ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bears fruit, well, and if not, then after this, thou shalt cut it down. Jesus is using a parable here on usefulness. How important it is to bear fruit. How important it is to win souls. How important it is for us to remember our commitment and to reenact that commitment and to keep that commitment alive. Sometimes we sing the song when the saints go marching in. I want to be among that number. Unless we are part of the saints that go marching out, we will not be a part of the saints that go marching in. And we must go out to the world, to those that are lost. The world is counting on us, and the Lord is counting on us. The message of commitment is a message of hope. Hope for a world that is lost, hope for Christians, hope for individuals. It is a message of realization, realizing that God has never given us more than we can do. He does not expect any more from Woodson Chapel than what we're able to do. But I believe today, just as sure as my name is Wendell Bird, I believe that God expects us to do what we are capable of doing. And I do not believe that God is pleased when we do any less. I believe our elders believe that. I believe that Brother Norwood... Brother Cornwell, Brother Hunter, and other gospel preachers that are here, I believe that they believe in that commitment. God does not expect any more of us, but he does not expect any less. I do not believe that the church or that the city at Corinth, the city at Ephesus, the city at Philippi and other places in the Bible that we read about. After the gospel had been preached and after the life of Jesus Christ had been preached to those people, I do not believe that those cities were ever the same because Jesus makes a difference. The gospel makes a difference. And our city is ready for something that is different. Matter of fact, our world is ready for something that is different. And we make the difference. And we can make the difference if we will only commit to it. We're committed to the Lord. And it should be our humble plea and our humble prayer. And we need to say, as Samuel did alone of old, speak thy servant here. And when we tell the Lord to speak, then we need to be ready to listen. And when we say speak, then we need to be ready to do. And when we say speak, then we need to be ready to go. And when we say speak, we need to be ready. Whatever Christ would have us to do. And it's not for the preachers, and it's not for the elders, and it's not for a certain few. 
but it's for all of us. If the homeless do not find shelter, if the hungry do not find food, if the naked do not find clothing, if the cold do not find a place of warmth, if the sick do not find a place of healing and concern, and if the lost do not find Jesus, then we have failed miserably. We come to worship for two things. We come to get, and we come to give. And if we leave this place with either one by itself, then we'll miss the boat. For you see, this morning you gave in your singing, in your prayer, you give in your attention, and we get. I was encouraged by the singing. I was encouraged by the prayer by Brother Osborne. I was encouraged when these men brought the communion over to me and I remembered Christ. And I was encouraged when Brother Hunter read from Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Paul in Ephesians was talking about commitment. We're committed to Christ. He wants us to be. I'm committed to Christ because in closing, I'm the light of the world. I'm committed to Christ in my life, in my dedication, in my obedience to my faithfulness, and to my seeking and saving the lost. This is what we're committed to. Jesus said, Matthew the 5th chapter and in verse 14, you're the light of the world. Are we letting our light shine? Are we letting our light of commitment shine to the world? That the world may look at us. Not know how many people participated in the Winter Olympics. Only thousands that were there. And of all those that trained their minds and their bodies, of all the hours that they put into, but only a few won the gold medal. There can only be one winner, only one in each category. But that's not true today. For every person here can be a gold winner. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. Henceforth I have laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, might give me in that day. But not only to me, but to all that love has appeared. The thoughts of the Apostle Paul. He said everyone can be a gold winner. Everyone that's committed to Christ. Today if you're not committed to Jesus Christ, to his love, if you're not committed today to his obedience, to his faithfulness, we want to assist you. We want you to be committed We've heard a lot in the last few days about the presidential candidates. So many votes being committed to this one, to someone else. And that commitment to the first reading, the first ballot at the convention, will hold true. But what even is more important is our commitment to Christ. If you've never been baptized, why not today? Why not accept that commitment and be a part of it today? 
you've once been baptized into Christ and you haven't lived as you should. And your commitment to Christ is no longer what it should be. And you know it and God knows it and Christ knows it and the angels of heaven know it. And we probably know it. We humbly beg and humbly plead and want you to come to Christ. Will you come to Jesus? Will you commit to your life to Him while we stand and sing?